Turn with me tonight to the book of Mark chapter 4, my favorite chapter in the Bible. Glory to God, I want to deal with this. Spirit of God's been dealing with me. I'll do a little teaching and preaching tonight. Glory to God, I believe you'll be blessed. Mark chapter 4, we'll start reading with verse 1. And I, I want to deal with this tonight. The Bible says in Mark 4 verse 1, He began again to teach by the seaside. And there was gathered unto him a great multitude, so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea. And the whole multitude was by the sea on the land. And he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine. Hearken, behold, they went out a sower to sow. Not, not sowers, but sower singular. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. The fowls of the air came and divided it up, and some fell on stony ground where it had not much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scarce, and because it had no root, it withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. Verse 8. Others fell on good ground that did yield fruit that sprang up, underline that, and increased, underline that, and brought forth, underline that, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. In that verse, God is dealing with series of three. Sprang up, increased, and brought forth. Some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Now, some people say God was not dealing with economic substance there. That he was dealing with the word and the word was Jesus and the salt of the earth. And, all. and I understand all of that. But what's of it in the word can be received 30, 60, and 100 fold if we believe what Jesus said. If it's in the word. Now if it's not in the word, then we can't receive it. But if it's in the word, then it's ours. Now notice it says sprang up, increased, and brought forth. Tell my message tonight, dirt digging days are over, it sprang up time. <laughs> dirt digging days are over. It is sprang up time. Not spring, it's sprang up time. I want to deal with that today. God began to deal with this the other day, and he said, I said, Lord, others fell on good ground, did you fruit, sprang up, increased, and brought forth. He said, that's all I ever wanted to see to do was sprang up, increased, and brought forth. I said, Lord, there's been some seeds I've sown that did not sprang up, did not increase, and didn't bring forth. He said, it ain't my fault. You, you just put it in the wrong mud. He said, the key to it is not your seed. The key to it is the soil that you sow it into. Now, I want you to listen to this point. You don't have to go down to a seed. It will spring up to you. See, a lot of people are going down to the seed to make sure that it's been planted. My Lord, you ought to simply plant the seed and go trustfully away. And believe that the soil that you sowed in, that you heard from the Almighty God. So I want to deal with this part spraying up. See, soil has within itself a force of nature. You need not disturb the seed, you need to disturb the weeds. The problem with a lot of people, they're not receiving what God wants them to receive because they're constantly jacking with their seed and you're putting your seed in the shock. I have just finished phase two of my ministry buildings. Make a long story short, we went in there and I wanted big stuff as far as landscaping was concerned. I didn't want to have to, you know, I didn't want to plant a tree and have to live to 130 years old to see it to be at least eight foot tall. So I got a hold of this landscaping firm and I said, hey, I want everything big. He said, you want oak trees? I said, I want live oak trees. We live in the city of, uh, actually in the suburb of the city of New Orleans, Louisiana, and they got these big, huge, massive oak trees. I said, I want to line my street with oak trees. He said, well, what, what size? I said, I want them at least 25 foot tall. He just looked at me, well, where, where, where do you get that stuff? Well, you know where I first found out where big stuff grew was at Disney World. And if a stinking mouse and a fairy can have a big tree, a white-headed preacher can have a big tree. You understand what I'm saying? Every time I've gone to Disney World or Disneyland, I see all this beautiful landscaping, and then you go to another building, some church, and they got a shrub about the size of the shoe. So I got a hold of this company. I said, I want everything big. Do you understand? I want big trees. I want it look like it's been growing 20 years. He said, man, that's going to cost a lot of money. I said, I ain't broke. Do I look broke? He said, no, sir. I said, go get the trees. He told these people, go get the trees. <laughs> and buddy, you walk in there right now. I mean, it went from a barren wasteland desert look to, oh, I'm telling you, look like it. Well, Mickey Mouse looked like he's going to come out the door. 
because there's huge trees. I mean, and we got people stopping in the city of North and say, where did you get these trees? How did you do that? Glory to God. They said, man, that's a beautiful tree. I said, no, that's a lot of money. That's what that is. But I prayed over those trees and that man prayed with me. He's got to guarantee them for one year. <laughs> I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. I mean, and, 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 the, and already the, the trunks on them things are huge. And they put it, how'd you get them there? And 18 wheeler trucks had to pick them up back holes. I mean, you should have seen this. It became an instant forest. It was wonderful. So he, he told me, he said, now you got to water these a lot and all this kind of stuff. I said, let me show you. I said, put the holes on it. We'll water it. And I laid my hand on that tree. I said, now Jesus! And it shocked him when I hollered. Well, you know, I want to make sure the tree heard me. You got to understand something. When I bought this piece of property, it was loaded with trees. I, I cut down over, what, Kathy, 900 trees? Because I had to clear it. But then I put almost 3,000 trees in the ground. And because in New Orleans, you have to drive pilings, you know what I'm saying? 45 foot long, bless God, so you get down to that bedrock down there. Because if you don't, your house will going to sink. That's just the way it is. So, I mean, if you, if all the dirt could wash away and those buildings would stand there. Of course, it'd be on stilts, but it could stand there. So I made up my mind. I said, Lord, I want to ask you something. Should I worry about my seed? He said, no, you should worry about the weed. In other words, don't disturb the seed, disturb the weeds. And the weeds are doubt and unbelief saying, oh, well, or if you didn't quite get it fast enough, my Lord, you can create your own weed. And you know something about weeds? They don't die with anything. They go through famine. They go through lack of water. I mean, you can run them over with an 18-wheeler truck and the next day they done grew another 18 inches. <laughs> but you buy that fine grass and you just spit on it and just kill it. <laughs> I mean, I put all new grass in it. I mean, I mean, we went from dirt to grass to uh, angry panthers and, and, and chinchillas and uh, uh, I don't know the name of them. A uh, uh, lot of flowers. <laughs> flowers everywhere. I mean, they got bumblebees going, heaven, heaven, heaven has come down. <laughs> and all the columns are lit up. In fact, Creflo and Taffy came and they saw it when it was about, what, 70% finished? And my God, Creflo went, whoa, look at him call it. Boy, you do something good when you impress a man named Dollar. <laughs> and there ain't nobody come to my office named Sense. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> we deal with dollars. Spring up time. You don't have to go down to a seed. It will spring up to you. So Saul has within itself a nature, a force of nature. You need not disturb the seed because get away from digging it out of the ground. Spring up seasons here. Dig it out, put your seed in the shark. For years, I never could receive a harvest on a seed I sowed to Kenneth Hagin Ministries. That's true. First time I ever gave $10,000 in my life, 19, what, 83, 84? I believe it was 84. I had never met Kenneth Hagin in my life. I went to a meeting and somebody said, go to Kenneth Hagin's meeting. I went down there and I'm just sitting there. Ain't nobody knew me. So I'm just sitting there and some white-headed guy, I don't, what was his name? Uh, uh, he, he was going to receive the offer. Uh, Norval. That was, I thought his name was Norval. I said, boy, where did he get that name at? What was his mama thinking of when he named him Norval? <laughs> you know, I thought, I've never heard of the name Norval. I've heard of Marvel. You know, Marvel Compton, not Norval. Anyway, so I'm just standing there. He said, the Lord said that there are several $10,000 givers here today. And I said to myself, mm-hmm, okay. It ain't me, but it's Okay. And this man sitting right next to me said, man, and when he said 10,000, it went, you know, you can tell when God touched you. I went, <clears throat> I don't even know these people. And beside the guy talks funny. And this guy said, mister, mister, the Lord just told me to give $10,000. I said, I heard it, man. I heard it. Let me get away from you. I'm over here. I I'm stand over here. I heard the Lord give that, tell that man. He said, the Lord said, I told him, but I told you too. I said, I don't know that guy. He said, well, I do. I said, well, then you give him the $10,000. I, I don't know the guy. I said, I'll never give $10,000 in my life. I said, beside God, beside, come, come in, come in, come in. That's all I got. He said, that's all I asked for. <laughs> he said, I didn't ask you to stretch your faith. Just give me what you got. You ever been disappointed when God told you to give something? I was disappointed. Do you know how hard I work for that? He said, do you know how hard it took me to get it out the ground to you? I could have given it to you a lot easier, but see, you, you worked for it and said, let me give it to you. See, I dug it out the ground. See, that's the problem with most ministries. They dig, and instead of helping themselves, they're putting their seed in shock. My God, I got home. I gave that $10,000.
I said, okay, I'll give it to you. But I want to tell you something. And I don't know what it is, but as soon as I figure it out, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> Kathy said, isn't this wonderful? I said, oh, the dumb woman, this is the woman. She's going home broke. Bless God, don't have no idea. But you know, I didn't understand prosperity that much. I never gave it. I mean, my biggest gift from that time far was only $100. I mean, God jumped you strong. From $100 to $10,000 is a big jump for a Cajun boy. You know how much crawfish I can buy with $10,000? <laughs> Don't laugh. I can, I can drive it to Los Angeles and sell it to you for $12 a pound. I ain't stupid. I went to the ditch and got it for 65 cents. Come on, what you got? <laughs> my point simply is this. I mean, I moved that seed around in my mind, and I tell you what, it took several years before I could receive a harvest off that seed. In fact, I didn't receive the harvest offer till 1991. When I was out jogging, I was out running more. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, you know that seed you sowed? I said, yeah! I forgot it! I ain't seen nothing from it! He said, the problem is you've never let it have any time to grow. You've been moving that thing, digging on it, you've got it in shock. Will you get your stinking hands off of it? I said, all right, Lord. He said, besides, you never named your seed. He said, so if I did what I wanted to bless you, I wouldn't have known how to bless you because you didn't know what you was wanting. Man, I took off running. I found, I thought, that check is in my tax records, which we keep up in the attic. I took off running, glory to God. And I came up with that sermon I preached in 1992. Hey, that's my harvest. That's mine. It's called naming your seed. And ladies and gentlemen, my God, within one week, after I named my seed, after I took my hand off the stinking seed instead of digging it up, getting it in a shock all the time, just let the thing so within one week. And I, I remember I said, devil, you robbed me. You owe me sevenfold. I didn't know anything about the hundredfold then. I said, you owe me seven times. Within five days, I had $70,000 in cash. In five days. Why? I quit digging it out. Sprang up time came. All I had to do, it could have happened immediately. Just stand there and watch because it, it was good soil. All I had to do was just stand there and watch it sprang up, increase, and bring forth. But the first thing I thought of, and this is probably most ministry, we got to figure out what we got to do to go get this money. How are we going to do this? So let's get us a plan and a project or let's create a crisis. And I've seen that happen in ministries. Because they figure you got to give something for people to give to. You got to get them to, you know, where you're going to move them emotionally. And you know, that's why a lot of people don't give anymore. They've been moved emotionally instead of what God told them to do. And before you know it, they quit giving and because they got disappointed because the word of God didn't work. You see my point? But if you just plant that in good soil and don't dig it out and just leave it the way it's supposed to be, it will, it will begin to grow. That's, that's what those trees, the, the worst thing I can do to that landscaping out there is start moving that stuff around. Just leave it there, water it, let it settle down, fertilize it, do the different things you need to do, and it will sprang up or spring up. Now, you may not know how, because Mark 4, 26 says, you put the seed in the ground, you get up in the morning, he don't know how it happened, it just come to pass. It's not your job to know how it's going to happen. It's your job to simply put your seed in the ground and trustfully go away because you planted it in faith. Now, what I do with my seeds, I shower my seeds with scriptures. Shower your seeds with scriptures that declare God's promise every day. I shower my seeds with scriptures. I hadn't forgot anything. You're looking at a man, buddy. I, I don't mean to sound arrogant. Let me boast a little like Paul the Apostle said. I got a brain, son, that just won't quit. Now, Brother Colton said it was small, but it, it got a lot of compartments in it. <laughs> and you don't tell me something in my ministry. And I mean, I can ask that finance department and Kathy and them say, boy, don't question. You. He'll tell you exactly where, what is. The, what? And they'll say, they'll give me a figure. I say, it's not right. They say, oh, yeah, it's right. I said, no, it's not right. And I'll give them that figure. And they say, Kathy said, don't argue with him because he knows. Well, I know everything's going on out there. They say, I've been in a building program, which I never really wanted to get into. I just wanted to buy a building. But I've learned so many things about buildings. It's called patience. And I thought, bless God. And I, I was excited to see it happen. And I had never done that. So it was a challenge to me. So I went out there. And I began to look around. And I said, God said, always keep your ears open to me. So I said, okay, I will. And so I'm sitting there in my office and the Spirit of God spoke to me. There was a crew of black men out there and about three Mexicans. And they were working like, I'm like dogs. I'm talking about it's hot. And they're pouring that cement, that concrete. I mean, it's hot. And you know, because New Orleans is Africa hot. You know, you can drown breathing because the humidity is so hot. <laughs> It'll hurt you sometimes. 
And I'm sitting in my office and there's six men out there. And the Spirit of the Lord said, go to the bank and get six $50 bills. I heard it just like, I, 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 are you hearing me? I said, what? He said, go get six $50 bills right now. Just, just go do what you do what it tells you. So I, Cassie, where are you going? I said, I'm going to the bank. I'll be back after a while. I went to the bank. I got six $50 bills. That's $300. He said, now go out to that, to that construction site. I said, okay. What do you want me to do? He said, I want you to give every one of those men $50 and buy them dinner. I said, okay. So I got my 300 bucks. Bless God, I came back. I said, Lord, can I stop at the house? He said, yeah, you can stop at the house. I stopped at the house and I put on some shorts and a t-shirt and some old busted up tennis shoes. I come walking out there and I heard, as I walked by, I heard one of the guys say, that's the owner. That's the owner. The guy with the white hair, he's the owner. <laughs> I drove up there in the S500 Mercedes Benz and I got out and those Walmart shorts that cost $3.30. <laughs> And I learned that from Jerry Savelle. <laughs> He's a Walmart boy. <laughs> he loved Walmart. <laughs> he gave him all the time. <laughs> he bought him five dollar shots, you know. But anyway, my mom was three dollars and thirty cents, and in a free T-shirt from Kenneth Copeland Ministries. <laughs> I got out of S five hundred white Mercedes Benz. <laughs> Glory to God, ninety six thousand dollar car. <laughs> I come out there, about five dollar pair of tennis shoes. I said, that's the owner. He said, don't look like no owner to me. What do you own, a garbage can? I ain't own nothing. I walked out there. I said, how y'all doing, guys? They said, fine. I said, hey, man. I said, I was in my office praying, and the Spirit of God spoke to me. You know, of course, they, they work in cement. They go, Spirit of God spoke to you, huh? <laughs> yeah, they think you're some fool, you know. I, I can think what those black guys are thinking. That dumb cracker, he ain't got a lick of sense. <laughs> He didn't work in that <laughs> So I said, excuse me, excuse me. I said, you married? <laughs> he said, yeah. And the other guy said, you lying? You ain't married. You living with that woman. I said, whoa, whoa, baby, whoa, whoa. <laughs> tell the preacher. He's a, he's a heathen from hell. I tell you what he is. I said, no, we, we didn't come here to know about his life. I said, let me tell you what I came to do. By that time, they said, back up, Reverend, because that truck's throwing that cement in there. Man. I said, oh, no, that's all right. And I stepped off in that cement. I said, give me that shovel. And I'm on the side. And God said, well, no, you ain't got to. I said, well, yeah, I don't mind. Come on. I said, I want y'all to listen to me while we're doing this. I said, am I doing this right? Yeah, do it like this. One guy said, yeah, do it over here, Rev. I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was enjoying myself. I ain't never laid concrete in my life. Boy, I mean, I'm out there, boy, and I'm just going with it. I said, the Lord spoke to me. Give you each $50 so you can take your wife out and, you know, and that girl that you think is your wife. <laughs> I said, I just want to bless you. And I stopped like that. I'm going to tell you something. You look like you hit them guys between the head. It, 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 they went, what? I said, I said, here, I want, I want to bless y'all. So I took out six fifty dollars bill and I gave them all of it. I'm, 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 I'm in cement. I mean, I'm in there, you know. And when they go, oh, and there's the truck. Oh, the guy said, you got to spread the cement. The Mexican guy said, forget that guy. Give me that. I want them. I, I'm going to take the money. <laughs> so my God, I gave him the money. I said, I said, the Lord just told me to tell him, go out, eat dinner, and enjoy yourself. I said, man, I appreciate you guys doing this work for me. I know it's hot and it's hard and it's tough. And they're just looking at me. I said, well, we better finish this. I said, I probably ain't no good, so y'all show me what to do. And I had a good time. I spent spent about 40 minutes out there, you know, until they finished that particular truckload of stuff, you know. And then I I said, now, how do I get out of here? (laughs) You know, know? they said, that's all right. They did all that stuff. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that touched those men. One of them, the, the owner said this, or the head of the crew said, I've been doing this for 35 years. Ain't nobody ever treated us like idiots. Always treat us like scum, trash. You came out here and helped us. Plus, you gave us money. I said, well, I did. And I said, the Lord told me just to bless you. Well, you know, three months passed. We had to pour another parking lot. I didn't go. They poured it. They were pouring it. And they were just about finished when I got there. I said, uh-huh, uh-huh. I said how much I owe you guys? They said, Nothing. You know, no one's ever blessed us. No one's ever given us anything. No one ever acted like we were human beings. We've always been just, oh, shut up, do this, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But you jumped in that concrete with us. And you, Reverend, that was a $14,000 slab. They did it for free. That was a seed. I'm saying this. There's some soils you may not realize are better ground than some of the places you're around. You see and I showered that seed with scriptures that declare God's promises every day. Now I go out there, man, hey, how you doing, man? 
and I have become friends with all these different construction crews. Yeah. And it's amazing what God is. And, and I'm not doing it to get a deal because the reason why I went out there is just I've never done that. So that was a challenge to me. In fact, Sister Gloria's nephew, what's his, uh, Gary, is he your nephew, I believe? He, I, he says, they all talk, you know, he's the only Texan. Just you ain't need to go out there and bless God getting that cement. I said, that's all right, Gary, how you do? And then I go to, oh, no, oh, no, you don't need to do that, Mr. Mr. Jesse. I, mean, we, I said, no, I don't mind. I ain't got nothing else to do. So I Because if, if I go in the office, they're going to make me work. I'd rather work out there. Yeah, I don't like going to Kathy's office. She says, sit down. Sometimes I got to remind them, my name's on the building. They go, yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, <laughs> my point is, I shower every seed I have with scriptures every day. See, committing to leaving the seed sown is an exercise of faith. Write that down. Committing to leaving the seed sown is an exercise of faith. Never think that a delay is a denial from God. Just because you hadn't got it doesn't mean that God's denying it. Never think that a delay is a denial from God. Hold on, hold fast, and hold out. You have a divine servant, a divine spirit, and a divine word fertilizing your seed. See, simply because you hadn't got it yet, that's not as a, don't think that's a denial from God. Hang on a second. My Lord, just hold on, hold fast, hold out. You got a divine spirit, you got a divine savior, and a divine word fertilizing that seed. And when God does that, it springs up or sprang up. But for years, I didn't know that. I thought you had it. Well, Brother Colton first said it years ago. You don't have to raise money. Now, I don't have a problem with people raising money. I don't misunderstand. But what I'm saying is, if your soil is right, your seed is right, your fertilizer is right, your, your seed is going to spring up. Now, all these things have to be right. And you shouldn't be given because you just like somebody. I had a lady one time not long ago in Florida come up to me in front of everybody. I mean, everybody, the whole church is slapped full. She walks up, and they, you know, people started walking up and giving money like that. And, and, and this lady walks up and says, I want to give this to you. You know, I didn't know. So she's reaching in her purse, and I never thought, I thought, I don't know what it is. You know, I never think about it. She pulls out $7,000 in $100 bills. She said, here. I looked, I said, Are you, do you want a receipt? Oh, no, we don't want a receipt. I thought, well, what, did they own a casino or something? <laughs> Seven thousand dollars, one hundred dollar bill. She said, "I just want to give it to you." I said, "Well, can I do what I want with it? Since you gave it to me, anyway, it's mine, right? And since you told me it's mine, personally, can I? Do it? Yeah." I said, "Well, I like to put this in God's work if that's okay." Oh, that would be fine. I said, "Well, why are you giving it to me?" And this is exactly what. Well, I said, "Why'd you give me that?" She said, "You don't look like you need it." <laughs> now, to the natural mind, tilt. Uh, uh, uh. What? She said, you don't look like you need it. I said, well, why'd you give it? She says, I don't know. And the Lord said, blessing the blessed. I will bless those that bless you. See, most people think you've got to have a sad, sick look to get something from God when you can look your best. And God will bless you beyond your wildest dreams because success breeds success. Oh, you understand what I'm saying? So that sprang up. Down. Bible said others fell on good ground that did yield fruit sprang up. Sprang up. So when it sprang up, God will give you more than you can receive if you just hold on, hold fast, and hold out. Now, some of you don't believe that God will do that for you. You've got to understand something about God. God don't look at your qualifications when he picks you. He looks at your heart. None of us meet the qualifications. Think about it, ladies. He picks you simply because he loves you and your obedience to him. When he picked let me tell you, God got a dysfunctional family to get three million people out of Egypt. <laughs> Moses, Aaron, and Miriam was a bunch of dysfunctional people. I was some weird people. I mean, they had more problems you could shake a stick at. My God, man. Moses couldn't even talk. He stuttered. I mean, how do you get three million people out to follow you? <laughs> follow me. I mean, it gets to the Red Sea. And there's his dumb brother who's nothing but a stinking wimp. I don't know what to do, Moses. Anybody just tell me what to do? That's exactly what I do. Then that crazy sister's a charismatic tambourine player. Come on, let's just play. That's what brought up the whole nation. Three dysfunctional people. 
I mean, Aaron is the biggest wimp you ever seen in your life. He got, I mean, people could make him do anything. I mean, and have a lick of brains and a lick of sense and a lick of bravery. And they say, you, you make us a golden calf. Okay, that's what they call me. I just make a golden cow. He stopped molding that thing. Oh my God, my Lord Moses, come down the mountain. Now you got to understand, they, they, they broke one commandment, but Moses broke 10. I told you, you want to throw the whole 10 now? That's dysfunctional. You don't break the whole 10 because somebody broke one. And he looked at that calf and he goes, ooh, 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 ooh. Where did that cow come from? <laughs> and that dumb brother, his Aaron said, I don't know, Moses, I just throw gold in the fire and I'll come a cow. <laughs> now that's Aaron. <laughs> that ain't good, see? That's dysfunctional. And his crazy sister. And she's mad because she thinks God ought to be talking to her more than talking to that stammering lip brother hus. But our, our, our brother, he made a mistake with Miriam. He married a black woman. You don't marry a black woman when you got a Jewish sister. <laughs> he married this black woman. He saw this mama and said, hey, get down with your back. Get the down with your back. That's it. That's it. The bad, my mama bad, mama bad. She said, "You don't dance like that, Moses. Come on, boy, you got to give it." <laughs> he go marry a black woman. Eddie, you don't do that. She got mad. You gotta understand something about black women. I love black women for one great reason. They got an attitude, man. Black women got an attitude. You look at them, they get, what'd you say? <laughs> if they, and if their hair stick out the way, just get a glump of grease, slap that baby, pull it down. You say? And you know that woman had an attitude. She walking around that camp. I done married the man. I got the man. The man belonged to me. Come on, baby. Man, my man. Woo! Talk to me. I'm the man. He's my man. And Miriam said, I tell you one thing. Because black women, white women don't act like that. I mean, the husband jump all over a white woman. Oh, 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 oh. But this is white women. What would what, 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 what you do? And that black woman said, follow me, child. I'll tell you what to do. Just come on. I'll just tell you what to do right now. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I like them. They got power. Oh, Moses, he said, you like my woman? You don't make some people mad. Miriam was so mean, I bet she shaved her, she shaved her legs with a weed eater. I don't doubt that. That's a mean woman. <laughs> you didn't think I was going to get funny, did you? Huh? That's a dysfunctional family. That's the seed God used to get the nation out. A stutterer, a wimp, and a crazy white woman. <laughs> She's mad because he married a black woman. She got struck with leprosy, and that's the whitest she ever been in her life. <laughs> that woman got white, boy. Moses prayed for her. Could you hear Moses? Lord, touch me, 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 <laughs> Miriam. <laughs> Help a lot. Nazareth, I don't. You spoke against me. I, I know Moses, but I, it wasn't my fault. You know, Miriam, you know, Jesus told me to do it. And I just do whatever anybody tell me to do. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. That's the three dysfunctional people. <laughs> Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. Pulled a whole nation out of Egypt. <laughs> That's why Moses didn't read the Ten Commandments. You know how long it took? <laughs> 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 
Da, 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 da. Read them for yourself. It's gonna take him all day to try to get through Ten Commandments. You ever find a message where he preached? But you find where he sings. Stutterers can sing. Boy, couldn't preach. I... But he could sing. Oh, Lord. People that stutter can sing because it's a melody that flows. Yeah. And you know, they all died in the same year. They all died about three and a half months apart. Never made it to the promised land. But God never separated Moses from that black woman. So I guess he believes in interracial marriage. Don't shout me down when I preach again. He don't care. If you don't care, he don't care. Don't make him no different. As long as you love each other, you're born again. What's wrong with that? That's what I told my daughter. I didn't care who she married. I told that boy of mine, he, uh, that my son-in-law, when he came to talk to me about marrying Jody, I said, I'm going to tell you two things. I want you to listen to me good. You can never bring her back. I said, this is forever, Ed. Look at her. She's beautiful. She's gorgeous now. Everything's in place. Take pictures. <laughs> she don't wear control tops now, but she will in about 20 years. <laughs> it is a benefit of God, Dad. <laughs> Can never bring her back. This forever, man. Look at her. I said, don't you ever hit her. You don't want to hit her. You want to hit her? You come to my house. I'll hit her. But you don't hit her. I said, you do that, you're fine. He said, that's good enough. And they've been married for now almost nine years, a little over nine years, I guess now. Don't have no babies yet, still got that cat. <laughs> I asked them the other day, I said, what's wrong with y'all? Do y'all ever do anything? I don't mean that sound rude, but my God, man, my head getting white. Jerry got four or five grand, baby. Glory to God, I'd just like to have one. Just one. I'd be a blessing now. My God, man. She said, well, Daddy, I ain't never had a brother and a sister. And you still, Mama, still can have a child? So I, slapped, I slapped the fire out. I could... <laughs> Shut your mouth. <laughs> I've never been depressed, but I tell you what, that, that would depress the socks off of me. Kathy did me that one time, you know. She, she gets me back. I was running, and, she, and she, I could always lap her. I said, get out the way, come on. She said, Jesse, I got to tell you something. I said, tell me on the next lap. Come on, I, I, I'm going over there. Man, I come running around, glory to She said, Jesse, I said, what, what, what? She said, I'm pregnant. I said, Jesus, help me. Oh, Jesus. I said, are you serious? And she, she runs like this. She said, April Fool's. I mean, it, I mean, I lost my heart, man. I mean, I was hurting back. I want that seed dormant. <laughs> Sprang up, increase. What does that mean? What do you mean by increase? Harvest cannot be hidden beneath soil. Write that down. Harvest cannot be hidden beneath soil. It must be ultimately seen. Some of you minister are afraid to, let, to tell people you're blessed. I had a preacher friend of mine, my God, drove nice cars, and he, all of a sudden, because of the scandals of the 80s, he thought, well, people ain't gonna give to him anymore. So he went and buy some dumb old car and drive around, you know, to make, and, and that's fraud. It made people think that's all they had. Harvest must be ultimately seen. Never be, I mean, not long ago, I'm a, I, I, I can't go anywhere in the city of New Orleans. I mean, Happy, Call, how Happy Caldwell and Jeannie Caldwell came to our home uh, and uh, they wanted to do some antique and we took them, and boy, we had a time. I mean, <laughs> oh, Happy, he said, what should I do? I said, just follow them, man, just follow the women. So we just got behind them, you know, <laughs> just follow them everywhere. Boy, Jeannie was enjoying herself and people said, hey, but just, hey, but just, I mean, and, and, and I mean, it, I, I can't go anywhere. I mean, not long ago, I mean, I'm standing, here comes an ABC guy. He goes, you're Jesse DePlanus, aren't you? I said, well, I guess you know that's true, yeah? Well, and he stuck that microphone in my face. That don't take long. Well, we heard you, we heard you do real well. I said, I do a lot better than that. He goes, uh, 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 what? I said, my God, man, if, it, if I didn't, you wouldn't have a job. I said, you ought to pat me on the back. I'm giving you a job. I said, I don't see you interviewing the homeless. 
I said, why do you want to interview me? I said, I, I, must be, I must be attractive to you for some reason or another. You better thank God that I have something because you wouldn't have a job. I mean, I didn't say, well, uh, what kind of car drive? Well, uh, 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 uh. no, no, I, 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 know. I wear my wealth well. And what I mean by that, I don't go around saying, let me tell you what I got here and I got that. I mean, I wear my wealth well. I'm not a broke man. I mean, I'm doing <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. I mean, you know, I, mean, I, mean, if I, I don't mean this arrogant. I, I, if I want to go, I want to buy a Rolls Royce, careful, I can go buy one tomorrow. I pay cash for that sucker tomorrow. I don't care. I can do that. All I got to do is have Kathy write me a check. She got all my money. <laughs> it's that. I, can buy that, I can buy that sucker cash if I want to. I don't mean that arrogantly. Well, you know, if I want one, fine. I don't want one, you know. You, just, you know, your you priorities, just whatever you want, you know. And, and Kathy's always saying, what do you want, Jesse? I don't know what I want, but whenever I see it, I'll get it. I don't really think about it that much, to tell you the truth. You know, I don't. I just, I enjoy myself. You know, if I see shorts that cost $3.30 and I like them, I buy them. If I want a Brioni suit, and this is one of them, I buy them. I don't care. It's whatever I want. It, it may be, I don't mean that arrogant. I just simply, and I'll say it on television, Brioni, goat's hair. <laughs> it's fact. I don't care. You, well, I tell you what, I ain't going to give you no more. You know what I'm giving them to start with? That's not this year. I don't use your money. I told you, man, I don't use your money at all. I got sources of income. My God, man, I, I'm a blessed man. Why? Well, I'm not a fool. I serve a Jewish God. I should have some sense. <laughs> I should know how, be able how to handle finance. But I mean, I, 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 Creflo's not hurting by no means, but I find he wears his wealth well. But there are some people say, I tell you what, you know, they, they don't wear their wealth well. And then people misunderstand that. And then all of a sudden people are preaching against prosperity simply because you're not wearing your wealth well. If God's blessed you, give God the glory. Nothing wrong with that. Let people, and let people see the harvest and never make an excuse. Because most preachers and most people say, boy, that's a brand new dress, isn't it, sis, so and so? Well, I got it on sale. <laughs> oh, the first deacon from the first Baptist church wife gave it to me. Well, that's nice, but you shouldn't make an excuse for that. Say, man, God has blessed me. God has honored me. I don't want to say this, but I have, my Lord, this is talking about increase. I was asked to preach for an NFL team. And I thought, my God, what am I going to say to this team, this professional football team? So I went. And I thought, well, what am I going to say? And sure enough, I walked in there. You could tell that they said, I wonder what this preacher want. I wonder how much you're going to ask us for. You could see it. I mean, you can read people. You know, if you're a preacher and a politician, usually you can read people. You have to learn to read. You can tell when you don't have them and you can tell when you got them. So I'm standing there and I'm thinking, my God. And that guy comes, how you doing, preacher? How you doing, Reverend? You know, you can tell these guys get hit on all the time, George, you know, because they make money and all that kind of stuff. You know, can you help me out with this project? Could you, could you do this? Could you do that? And all that kind of stuff. I didn't say nothing. So I'm just standing there and the guy that invited me, uh, the chaplain of that NFL team, I call it a chaplain, I don't know, whatever. You know, they had a minister there. He said, we asked Brother Jesse if he would come and speak to us. So they're sitting like this, look. Uh, you know, these guy's making money. You know, I think it's the cheapest one's 340000 or 400000 like this. And I thought, what am I going to say to these fools? <laughs> so I got up, and the Lord said, say this. I said, oh, no, God, we don't want to say that. He said, say it. You'll get their attention. I said, well, first, I said, I want to thank you all for coming today and allowing me to speak to you. But I want to set you all at ease. I make more money than all of you. They went. I said, take you seven years to get yours. I can knock that down six months. I said, so you got nothing I want. They all straightened up. I said, now nah, I come here to tell you about Jesus. I don't want nothing you got. I'm going to just tell you about Jesus. And I began to minister. Before you know, them big old boys just crying. It's something to see a man, 295 pounds, arm as big as my leg. <laughs> He wanted to come cry on me, and he put his head, man, he hurt me, his head as big as a microwave. And he, I mean, my God, man, you know, I don't want this. He's just, he's just crying off my shoulder. I mean, God said, tell him the truth. And I did. And they just freaked. And you wouldn't believe the respect that came. All of a sudden, their whole attitude changed. They said, get that preacher in home. 
I said, I don't want nothing you got. And all of a sudden, it wasn't no more than two weeks later, one came to my house, knocked on the door. He said, Reverend, uh, I don't mean to bother you. Here's $5,000. Got in his truck and took off. I said, uh, praise God. I said, Kathy, <laughs> she I fell football player just gave her $5,000. She said, that's wonderful. Now, I didn't come up there and say, I tell you what, I believe I that. You know, I related to Eric, and I, just, I don't know how I'm going to pay his bill. But, 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 and, uh, but, but, but would you help me? No. I sowed in good ground. It brought forth fruit that sprang up. It brought increase. What does it mean? A seed takes root downward and bears fruit upward. So it must be seen. If you believe in prosperity, it must be seen. Not so people can say, I'm talking about the Christian people. Oh, look what they got. Because that's what the Philistine sees. That's what the world out there sees. They fought me ferociously over this international com ministry complex I'm building. And now they're saying this. My God, we should have shut our mouth. Look what that man built. I mean, they're coming and said, man, we have New Orleans bus tours stopping, Jerry, to ask if they can tour my building. Because they go to all these plantation homes all over. I tell them, no, we got to work there. <laughs> Greffalo said, Jordan, five dollars a tour. <laughs> <laughs> Money coming. <laughs> I get Leroy down out there. You want to go? <laughs> I mean, they're stopping. Can we look at this? And it's all to the glory of God. They said, is that the church? I said, oh, no, no, that's just administrative office. Huh? Look, my tax attorney is a Jew. All right? And when you impress a Jewish tax attorney, you've done something. We drove by. He said, man, my God, what's the government building over there? I said, it ain't the government. That's our building. <laughs> Woo! He said, I have to raise my rates. I said, I'll send you back to Egypt. <laughs> Raise your rates. <laughs> oh, my God. A seed takes root downward and bears fruit upward. Christianity means more than just sowing. It also means reaping. I said this earlier in the week. Why does everybody believe if you sow a bad seed, you get a return? But if you sow a good seed, you're not supposed to expect a return. In other words, if somebody messes up and commits adultery, boy, people get up and say, boy, I tell you what, God going to beat your stinking brains out, rip your head off, buddy, you got a harvest coming back that you ain't never seen. But now, if you go give a good seed, now don't expect anything in return. Well, why would you believe it on the bad side but not believe it on the good side? Well, you understand what I'm saying? Seed's going to produce, and you know not how, but you don't need to know how. You see, wherever there's a preacher with a harvest in his pulpit, there'll always be a devil in his pew. Write that down. Wherever there's a preacher with a harvest in his pulpit, there'll be a devil in his pew saying, I'll tell you one thing, I just don't think he ought to have that. Well, did he ask you? I don't mean that rudely, but I mean, my God, man, what's wrong with blessing the man of God or blessing the woman of God? What's wrong with blessing you? Blessing's a blessing. Amen. Well, but see, because you have that poverty spirit and it really isn't your fault. It's really religion's fault. It's really preacher's fault who have preached it for centuries. And said they move people to finance poverty by moving on the emotional feeling instead of giving according to the way God tells you to give. And they expect the 30, 60, and 100 fold return. So when the devil sold us that bag of goods, he knew we couldn't finance the revival that God was sending. So it would stop within the four walls of our church or within uh, a few miles out of our city. So that, you know, figure out what this boy is doing because he's not that smart. Because you can really understand him through the word of God. Religion will always send showers of adversity, but the sunlight of prosperity will dry them up. So I'm always expecting. I never forget a seed that I sow. I never do. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Why? I'm a good businessman. And also I expect to receive because I, I plant it in good soil. But I don't go dig it up. I get the weeds away from it, but I leave the seed so I don't throw it in the shock. I told this guy to put those trees up there. I said, now, nah, we don't want to lose any tree. He said, well, sir, they're guaranteed for a year. If you're losing, I'll replace one for free. I said, well, fine. I appreciate that, but I don't want to replace any because then I got to wait another whole year for that thing to reroot itself and all that kind of stuff. I want everyone to take. He said, you know, no one's ever told me that. Everybody always told me, well, boy, if, you know, if one goes bad, you're going to have to replace it. I said, I don't want to replace it. I want you to make all the money that you're supposed to make on this job. I want you to be blessed. I want every tree to take. I don't want to have to replace one because then I got to wait another spring, winter, summer for thing for it, you know, for it to root itself. He said, you know, I never thought about that. I said, if you think like that, you will stop losing trees and shrubs. Now, when you put it in the ground, pray over it. Pray over it? Yeah. 
Pray over it, man. I said, my God. I said, how many have you lost? A bunch. I said, hey, give it your best shot. Come on, man. I said, That's, the prayer is better than fertilizer. I said, the Lord looks at trees. He saw one that wasn't bearing fruit and he cursed it. Why? He expected it to produce what it was supposed to do. Sprang up, increase, and bring forth. You see? So that's what increase is all about. As a seed takes root downward and bears a fruit upward. What I'm saying is let people see the harvest that's on your life. You have to. Why? Because that is the, that's the evidence. Now they're going to say, well, you're just saying that to manipulate people. No, you're not. And, you, know, you, you won't convince them anyway. No, you're not. You just keep believing. After a while, they get on your train. They begin to say, wait a minute, something's working here because they see what you're doing. Well, if it sprang up and increased, then it brings forth. What does that mean? Bro brought forth means there's no such thing as a fixed income. Fixed is not for you because you're not in a fix. If you got a fix, then you're an addict to Satan's plant and an addict to the government's plant. So you throw away the seed syndrome, you throw away the 36 and 104, and now you're fixed. You need another fix. How many times people retire and the first thing they do is have to cut back their lifestyle because now we're on a fixed income. Fix simply means you become an addict to Satan's way of finance. You see, because see, that's all you're going to make. That's all you're ever going to do. When that, that's not the seed principle. That's not the laws of sowing and reaping. So you need a fix. Well, man, get away from that fix because fix don't make, The harvest on your seed will fix your bills. Your job is not intended to pay all your bills anyway. Your job is intended to give you a seed so the 36 and 104 will take care of all the bills you ever need. Take care of everything, see? So why be on, yeah, but I'm 75 years old. Why? Well, why do you have to be on a fixed income? Once you fix yourself, you shut yourself down. You shut down the principle of God in your life. Oh, Lord. When, when you understand what I'm trying to say, see, once you fix, then you fix to that system. God can't bless you because you own a fixed income. All of a sudden, you cut your lifestyle. You work all those years. You live real good. Then when it's time that you can really enjoy you and your wife, wham. Okay, honey, I'd love to take you somewhere, but I can't go. Now you're on the system of Satan. You're on the system of the world saying, well, this is as much as you can make. Or this is all you're ever going to make. And you better get used to this bracket, quote, of income. Uh, nothing succeeds like success. One victory leads the way to another. A faithful soul has a great treasure. So I, I will never be on a fixed income, ever. I, if Jesus tarries and I get 95 years old, I'm going to be producing 30, 60, and 100 fold to the day Jesus takes me home or to the rapture of the church. I'm not planning on retiring. To do what? To do what? Fish? How long can you fish? <laughs> How long can you play golf? I'll tell you how long I can play it, about 30 minutes. I got to quit because I'm backsliding. I don't play that game. That's a rebellious game. I don't have nothing to do with that stinking game. Because preachers do not speak in tongues. They curse out there. I've heard them curse. Then have to repent. I don't play that game. I get on a motorcycle. And if somebody cuts across you, there ain't nobody hearing what you're saying. Oh, oh, oh. You just go. That's all I'm going to say about that. Now, I want you to listen to this. I will not be in a fix. I will not. No, because see, I heard that all my life. I, and I love my father, but he's on a fixed income. I said, Dad, you could have so much more. And he ain't going to get mad at me when I say, but he said, I said, Dad, I could bless you, Dad. Oh, yeah, but you know, I, you know, I, 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 you know, I you know, I won't lose my social security. Daddy, listen to me. Oh, you don't, you, know, you don't understand. <laughs> okay. And I could do so much more. Oh, Lord Jesus. Yeah, but I don't want to lose it. The, the, the nation of the United Kingdom said, well, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this, you got to do that. When I was, I said, no, I ain't got to do that. All I got to do is pay your taxes. They looked at me, what? I said, I'm not going to do that. Well, I well, you say that because you're an American. I said, no, I don't say that American. I said it because I'm a man of God. I'm not going to do that. Well, then you can't, you can't take this thing. I said, but I don't, need, I don't need your help for me to preach the gospel in this nation. You want to pay your taxes? I pay your taxes. But I'm going to preach the gospel. And I'm going to control what God says I could control. And I'm not talking about me as a person. I'm talking about the board of directors of our ministry there in the United Kingdom. I said, now this is what it's going to be. You ain't going to tell me what to do with God's money. Now, I'm very blunt and to the point. When I do business, I do business. I don't, do, I don't wear this coat. I wear a pinstripe suit. And I just walk in there, glory to God. And I said, we're going to do some business here. And they, they said, well, no one's ever told us no. I said, well, welcome to the world. 
I said, I don't need your system. Do you understand me? You need me. You got 1% of your population going to church and that 1% don't like it. I said, you need me. I said, if you don't think, watch my program and watch what comes in. Go ask the people. We bring joy to this nation. Now, this is what we're going to do. And they went, okay. <laughs> because nobody ever thinks to say, well, you know, they all act like Aaron. Well, I tell you what, whatever you want me to do, I just what I'm going to do. Nah. No, 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 no. That don't work that way. Why? Because I'm doing God's business. Wherever there is attention, it should produce retention. Let me explain that. Wherever there's attention, it should produce retention. Anyone can have what is given, only the diligent have more. Let me explain something. You know why ministries and churches are having problems financially? They're not teaching their children. They don't understand the concept of perpetual giving. I got, you know, I was christened and confirmed a Catholic boy. Nomine Patri Fili, Spiritu Santo, you know. True my fault, true my fault, true my most grievous fault. You know? Don't get mad at me, I, I mean, I could do that. But you know what happened? I never could figure out how you could build a church for 600 years. Most of the cathedrals in Europe took 600 years to build. Now, how do you produce a 600-year building program? I'm going to show you. I got to thinking, my God, man, that's attention and it produces retention. And it struck me. How do you get people given to a project for 600 years when the average person in those days died at 40? Because of sickness, disease, 40. And some of these cathedrals took 600 years to build. Why? They understood the concept of perpetual giving. You think if God tells you to be a partner to a ministry, and I'm not talking about somebody that's messing up, I'm talking about somebody clean, somebody's doing something for God, wouldn't it be worthy of the support to teach it to your children? Let me tell you what they told me when I went to pre cana conference. And if you've been a Catholic, you know what I'm talking about. Before you get married, they want to talk to you a little bit. They said, do you promise to raise your children Catholic? How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? Hold your hand up if you've been Catholic at least once. Remember that? You promise, <laughs> at least once, you know. Do you promise to raise your children Catholic? And if you say no, you ain't getting married in there. Well, are you going to teach your children the Catholic doctrine, the Catholic of the mother church? Well, yeah. We'll do that. Then we will marry you according to the doctrines of the Catholic church, which is nothing wrong with that. I don't have a problem with that. But it dawned on me. We don't do that to our children. We tell them about the wonderful teachings of God, but we never tell them about the dreams and visions that God told us to plant in. See, so what happens is, as a partner gets old and dies out, all of a sudden that ministry who's still doing a great work begins to regress and back up because it doesn't have the finance to go forward. You know why? Because you never taught your children to be a perpetual giver. If God told you to be a partner, and I use Kenneth and Glory, then why wouldn't you teach your children to be partners to them? Why did it only have to a a last your life? It's just the same thing with your church. You have tithers in your church. If their parents are teaching those children to be tithers, why would they want to go to any other church? If that church is feeding them and blessing them. So if you're teaching, if you're tithing to your church, why wouldn't you teach your children when they got to the age of accountability and got married? You know what? This is a great church you were raised up in. It's been a blessing of the Lord. You enjoy. And automatically they start tithing to that church. And then their children's children start tithing to that church. And before you know it, you got a perpetual giving. 600 years pass and everybody's still blessed. All financial problems are gone. Why? Because they taught you how to be a perpetual giver. Well, I told Jody and Ed, I said, let me tell you something. As far as I'm concerned, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland, well, I will be their partner until Jesus comes and probably afterward. Glory, they'll probably be a KCM office somewhere in heaven, I guess. I, glory to God. I'll be a partner to it. That's fine with me. But I said, now, Jody, I don't, I don't tell you to do this because I, I can't tell you a full grown woman and Ed, you're a full grown man. I said, but the Lord moved upon me. You believe I'm a man of God? Yeah. Yeah, Dad, we believe you're a man. Yes, Mr. Pence, I think you are. I said, you know, then why would God tell me to support a ministry like that? And he wouldn't tell you. It's called the heritage of faith, like, 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 like Jerry in his book says. So I said, let me tell you something. Whatever I give to is good soil. And if it'll work for me, Jody, it will work for you. Yeah, but supposing Jesus tarries and Kenneth and Gloria go by the way of the grave. What's going to happen to KCM? Who cares? There'll be somebody else to take care of it and flow with it. And if everyone's been taught how to be a covenant individual, it will go till Jesus comes. 
Every man's work must be a continuation. It's called perpetual giving. And I can prove it to you in the Bible. Why did God choose Abraham? Why Abraham? Why, why not Moses be the father of faith? Why? Look at Genesis 18 real quick. Let me show you something. Why did God choose him? I know it's getting a little late, and I'm going to hurry here. Quick. Genesis 18, verse 17. Of Genesis. And, and the Lord said, Should I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? Genesis 18, verse 17, verse 18. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. He didn't say he's believing in him. He said, For I know him that he will, what? Teach, command his children and his household after him that they shall keep the way of the Lord. And you ever know something? Isaac did exactly what Jake, uh, Abraham did. Jacob did exactly what Isaac did. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were perpetual givers. What Abraham blessed, Isaac blessed. What Isaac blessed, Jacob blessed. And it started rolling. And before you know it, that nation grew under that system. So I want you to think about that. When you leave, if God has made you a partner to this ministry, then why wouldn't you make your children a partner? And your children's children. And yet, by the time they grow up, that it'll be a different world and God will tell them to support some other ministry and do some other things, but it will never stop the foundation of what they were taught. And it'll go and go and go and financial trouble will cease in the body of Christ and churches won't have to be struggling trying to figure out how to get something done because there's a generation coming up right after them, bless God, with the same principles that the generation that first built it. See, that's perpetual giving. Why did God call us all to be word of faith people? I'll tell you why. Because he knew us, that we would command and teach our children. And you can hear Kenneth and Gloria talk about their kids all the time. And that's all they talk about, the word of God. They taught the kids something. All of a sudden now, I see Kelly, I see Terry, I see John, and, and bless God. And man, they talk about the word of God. And then they, now they got the grandkids, glory to God. And they got Courtney coming up, praise God. How you? And she's saying the same thing. Listen, wonderful. Talk about the gospel, praise God. Like, I love the little statement that time she was sitting in the back seat. I think it was right with, with Max and Max, her little uh, cousin. And um, Max had his leg on her or something like that. And uh, she said, Get out of here, devil. Shut up, devil. Shut up. Something like that. And I think it was <laughs> John or uh, Marty said, why would you say that? She said, the Lord, uh, the devil just told me to break Max's leg. <laughs> now, that's funny to me. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> no, but, she, but automatically, she's rebuking the devil. Shut up, devil. I hope she was. Four, three, I don't know how old she was. Just a little bit. Now, you see, shut up, devil. Get out of here. Something was being put in that child. I saw her a while ago. She came up to me. Have a different. She's always loved me. Come look at the, at, the, at the TV. You know, she come up and hugged me. I said, man, you're getting so big. She said, I said, are you taller than Max? She said, no, but my head's bigger. <laughs> now, I don't know what that means, but that means something to Courtney. I don't know what that means, but I'll figure it out. Glory to God. I love children. It's a blessing of the Lord. But I saw something that was placed in that child. Now, why would you place the oracles of God in that child, but you won't place the dream and covenant of giving to the people God covenanted you with in the child too? What's wrong with that? And you keep producing and ministering a generation that will not back away from the word of God, that will believe God till Jesus steps on this planet. Well, I told that to Jody. I said, now, Jody, you don't have to do that. I said, but I'll tell you one thing. Is your dad blessed? She said, I'll tell you what. Mama got more jewelry than any one woman I've ever seen in my life. Jody noticed all that stuff. I said, well, that's what, that, I used to give Kathy jewelry for Christmas and, and birthdays and anniversaries. And any other day I feel led of the Lord to go buy her something. <laughs> Praise God. She likes jewelry. So I do that. Or flowers. And if she likes flowers, I'll send her some flowers. And, I, and we have little signs with each other. I sent her 46 flowers one time. 45 red roses and one white one. Always has a white rose in it. And they're always stuck down in the bottom. And, and the people can't figure it out, why do you want a white rose? <laughs> I don't have to send a card. She starts looking through there. Ooh, I don't know who that's from. Is it, it's a little signal. Glory to God, you know. Well, see, so, <laughs> and Ed's starting to pick up on that, you know. He, he, we learn from each other. So I have not only taught her the principles of God, I've also taught them, this is who God has commanded me to give and covenant with. Now, you don't have to because you are a full-grown adult. But look at what has happened to your father by the type of soil that he has sown in. And I would just say this. If you ask the Lord, I wouldn't be surprised. He'd tell you to be a part of this covenant and your children's children and your children's children's children and your children's 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 children. And 600 years later, the church is still being built by the same families. 
that is a great system. And God will choose people like Abraham who will teach them. And I do the same thing. And I put Jody in front of me and sat her down on a chair. And I laid my hands on her like Abraham did Isaac. I laid my hands on her and Ed like Isaac did Jacob. Like Jacob did his, his Joseph, his boys. And I pronounced the blessings of God on, that, on my daughter and on my son-in-law. Just like the old covenant. Say, well, you're new co- I know I'm in new covenant, but I thought, what a wonderful thing to do. Sit here, girl, and I, and I prayed the blessings of God that what's ever on my life shall always be upon thee. And them kids ain't barely, they've been married nine years. They're debt free. They paid their house off. They are blessed in the city, blessed in the field. They enjoy life better than I do. They've been to Hawaii more than I have. I mean, they go for two or three weeks. I go for four days. My God, they come back. They're blessed. Why? That covenant promise is on them. And and what I give, they give. And the other day we're driving, saw a little lady on the side of the road, stopped and said, how are you doing? She said, 78 years old and didn't have a bed. Jody said, get in the truck. And they went and bought a girl a bed because her son wasn't supporting the fine. I was very poor. And said, Jody didn't only just help the poor, she eradicated poverty. You understand what I'm saying? You understand? <laughs> we don't finance poverty in this family. We will not finance poverty. We will help you, but we will show you how to get out of poverty. Jody got him a bed, got her a bed, got her a place to live, and then got her a Bible study to go to. Said, listen, what you need to do, you don't need your son ain't taking care of you anyway. So let's get God to take care of you. And all of a sudden, that little old lady is doing fine, blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in, blessed going out. Why? Not only did we help the poor, he got rid of the poverty in her life. You see my point? You understand what I'm saying? Now that came from me, now it's already in her. And if we ever have any grandchildren, it'll be in them. <laughs> or it'll be in, I told her, if you do not give me an heir, that's going to be the richest cat in the city of New Orleans. <laughs> that stinking cat. We got to get, we got to do something here, glory to God. See, you know, and that's called perpetual giving. And God knows. And once you make a commitment... It's fine. Now, God will sometimes tell you to do a one-time thing, but you know who, when God covenants you, you a ministry or covenants you with a person, you understand and know that. Why? Because every time you plant, it springs up. It increases. It brings forth. It springs up. So dirt digging days are over. It sprang up time. Now, I, and I'm going to say this in close, my last closing, promise. When you have this on your life, children will notice it. I hadn't been around Terry and Rodney in what, three years, two years? I mean, I, because of all this building, we hadn't been to Jerry's house two years, I guess. No, at least maybe two, maybe more. I'm not quite sure. Now, uh, what's, Cassidy is her name. Now, when I saw her the, just uh, yesterday, I thought, my God, that kid grows. You, you know, you really see the difference when you don't see children. Now, Cassidy come walking up to me. She's just looking at me. And I went, hey, sweetheart. So I just, she looked at me. She goes, Papa Jesse. I said, Paul, Paul, I said, she goes, hi. I said, hi. So we just looked at each other and smiled. And then she hugged me. And then she told me to put her down. You can tell. They want you to go down. <laughs> just put her down. And I thought, why would this child come to me? I, last time I saw her, she was only about that long. You know, just, it, it, you know. And, well, she sent something. Children are the greatest people. They know when something's wrong, they can detect it immediately because the innocents can pick it up. They're so innocent, see, that any wrong thing a child will pick up immediately. So when I see a child, you know, they can tell if you're having a bad day. They can just tell. How many times I used to sit when I was a heathen rock musician, Jody barely could walk, look at me, said, something wrong, Dad? Wrong, Dad? I said, oh, no, something wrong? And as she grew older and I got born again, I, one time in my house, I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. And she walked by with a school bag. She said, well, go listen to your tapes, Dad. You'll find out. And she, she walked out the house. Just walked out the house. I thought, well, bless God. I'm going to the office, get my tape, find out what to do. You know, this was years and years ago. What happens is they're so sensitive. And I said that to say this. If you'll plant, sprang up, increase, and brought forth. If you'll put perpetual giving in them. From that very innocent age, they'll understand it completely. And they'll operate and function in covenant all the days of their life. And God's work will be satisfied upon the earth. And then one day, we'll have a last meeting at the West Coast or a last meeting at Southwest. Because then the next one will be in heaven. And I know where it's going to be. But there's a big pavilion up there where you can sit up there and just enjoy yourself. And there ain't no dark. 
and you don't get tired and your rear end don't hurt when you've been sitting all day and all that kind of stuff, it's a nice place. You enjoyed it tonight? Give Jesus a hand clap. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 